I'm Nick Place, Dean and Director of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. Established in 1859, the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences has been a source of innovation for the last 162 years. What started as the Georgia State College of Agriculture that taught forestry, veterinary medicine, animal husbandry, and home economics has grown into a robust learning environment that includes opportunities to study in fields such as food science and technology, poultry science, environmental resource sciences, and applied biotechnology. Research and education centers are central to the mission of the college, conducting innovative real-world research that solves difficult challenges in agriculture and the environment. The Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center is the oldest REC in the state, established in 1930. Many of the historic buildings at the REC today were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps and are still used by the community in Blairsville even today. These community resources are just one part of the important work done at the Georgia Mountain REC. With 415 acres in the North Georgia Mountains, the Georgia Mountain REC provides assistance to farmers in the mountain region by giving them research-based, science-backed resources that are tailored to this distinct area. This unique climate is ideal for breeding evaluation and research in ornamentals, turf forages, and a variety of row crops. The Georgia Mountain REC is leading the way in not only conducting meaningful, impactful research, but also in community engagement that, that elevates the mission of CAES and improves the lives of Georgians. We're glad that you are taking time to join us today and we're thankful for all of the hard work done at the Georgia Mountain REC and hope that you are able to benefit from the opportunity to hear from the scientists behind the research. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ray Covington, uh, superintendent at Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center, the northernmost research and education center in the state of Georgia. Welcome. I hope you enjoy today and uh, hearing about our many presenters, uh, our research projects, and what's going on. But let me tell you a little bit about our place first. We were established in 1930 and have been in the Blairsville area doing agricultural research that specifically helps producers in this area and this specific climate. You see up here, we're in agricultural zone 7A, which means that we get down to some single digit temperatures. And we also have a lot of rainfall in our area up to 58 inches per year. So it's very unique to the state of Georgia, which makes for some interesting research projects. And I'm gonna tell you about those a little bit today. So we're a 415 acre farm uh, located in the southern part of uh, Union County. And uh, we, our research focuses primarily on uh, several different commodities that you would see up here in the North Georgia mountains, like apples, wine grapes, blueberries, uh, which a lot of homeowners already have. But then we also do some row cropping, some soybeans, some corn, and then lots of ornamentals. So because of our unique climate up here in the North Georgia mountains, a lot of our work being uh, climate related, uh, we can evaluate new cultivars, new breeding programs, uh, the new plants that are developed through the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences and see how they do in this zone. And you'll see that because of this we have a greater reach uh, far above northern Georgia but other USDA zone 7As which include the Ohio Valley and even up into New York. So um, that's what makes us very unique in the state. We also have a very interesting component because we have a public access. Uh, people can come to our campus and see these beautiful gardens behind me uh, throughout the week. And we have a, a wonderful uh, partnership with a group of folks called the Community Council. And they're a group of volunteers that maintains this and also uh, puts on educational programs for youth. Uh, we have about 4,000 students come here per year, pre-COVID of course, and also about 600 adults for different seminars. So we're heavily involved with our community, our, our volunteer groups, and also with research supporting the college. So I hope you enjoy uh, your, the presentations today. And if you get a chance, come by and uh, see the public gardens in the future. Take care. My name is Wayne Hanna. I'm a professor with the University of Georgia in the Crop and Soil Science Department. I was a full-time employee with the University of Georgia <clears throat> since uh, 2003. Uh, before that, I was on a cooperative agreement with the University of Georgia, but I was an employee of the Agricultural Research Service, USDA. 
Uh, but we worked so closely with the university that people didn't know the difference. We worked for the taxpayer. It didn't make any difference to us either. Uh, but my first assignment, a project, when I came to Georgia in April of 1971 was a project here in Blairsville, Georgia. Uh, and, uh, and so I've been working here in Blairsville at the Research Education Center for over 50 years. Uh, and so uh, it's been a real pleasure and has been a tremendous asset to our research program to be able to work here. Uh, in Tifton, where I'm based, uh, we have a very sandy, uh, loamy soil, mild climate. Here, uh, we have a heavier soil. We have uh, low temperatures, cold tolerance. So a lot of our work is we do uh, our research here because we get testing for cold tolerance, which we cannot get in, in Tifton. Uh, and so this has been a tremendous benefit. Uh, the first project in 1971 was testing for a cold tolerance in a forage Bermuda grass. And out of that, uh, that testing came Coast Cross 2. We had Coast Cross 1 that was uh, uh, the highest quality we had, but it didn't have cold tolerance. So out of that came Coast Cross 2 for the rancher and farmer. But uh, since then, uh, I've been working here. Next, uh, really a big uh, project that we had was starting in the late 70s. We uh, developed uh, right the, the uh, second uh, green uh, low plot right there, uh, turf plot. That's Tiff Blair uh, centipede grass. Uh, and uh, we developed the germplasm here, and well, in Tifton, and we did the cold tolerance and testing for a low pH tolerance here in Blairsville. And it's been one of the most popular cultivars on the market uh, for lawns across the southern United States for the last 20 years. Well, of course, we have a new one coming about. The next one up here hadn't been named yet, uh, but it's also been tested up here. Uh, and we haven't given it a name, but it's going to be a very successful one also. But one of the uh, really key aspects of testing here uh, in Blairsville is that uh, a lot of grasses uh, may be, well, let me just say first, homeowners are interested in, in ornamental grasses that uh, are sterile, don't produce a lot of seed that drops and a lot of weedy uh, uh, volunteers coming up in the ground. Uh, and uh, we have techniques at Tifton that we know how to sterilize plants, uh, but a lot of plants are responsive at Tifton at the low altitude, say 200 uh, uh, feet altitude, uh, they will uh, be sterile. But if you bring them here at 2000, then they will be fertile. Uh, and so that gives us an opportunity to make sure they're st sterile at any altitude. Uh, and so one of the uh, tall green ones in the back here, uh, in the back of me, uh, that's a scout, that's a miscanthus, uh, that was put on a, a weedy list, uh, where a lot of states wouldn't allow uh, companies to sell it, but because it's sterile, a state like New York State now allows us to sell Scout because it's sterile at a high altitude. Uh, and uh, we have a, one right uh, uh, back of me here, the zebra looking plant. Uh, it's gonna be released this coming fall, and it's also a miscanthus that can set seed at higher altitudes, but here, this particular one doesn't because we irradiate it, cause it to be sterile. So anyway, here at Blairsville, the, the research, uh, UGA Research Education Center has just been a tremendous uh, asset to our total breeding program. It just uh, gives us a total breeding program. We, it allows us to test in diverse environments, uh, and because of that, uh, when these cultivars, whether they're turf or forage or ornamental, when they leave here, uh, leave our research plots, they will perform well across the United States. And a lot of, most of our grasses are uh, growing on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, and because of the testing that we get, be able to, uh, we're able to do here in Georgia and here at the Mountain Station. It's just been a pleasure uh, working here. Not only is it a great place to do research, it's a great place, a great uh, environment, the beauty of it, uh, just to uh, be here and work among this environment. And anybody that ever comes here to the experiment station ought to go to the top of the mountain here at the center uh, and, and get a view from there because it is just gorgeous. I've been doing it for 50 years and I still enjoy going to the top of that mountain and getting that view. Of course, uh, they give uh, tours here at the uh, mountain station uh, and uh, people should take advantage of that. Now, we also have about 20 different ornamentals uh, that are sterile, so uh, don't produce any seed. 
Uh, they were developed here and at Tifton, uh, and there's about 20 of them on the market. Uh, they, some of them are red, uh, they have red purple color to them, sterile. Uh, I've seen them grown all the way in Montreal. They grow them all the way to Montreal across the United States. And then we have another, and they all have, uh, these uh, red purple plants, they all have um, uh, royal names like Princess Caroline, Princess Molly, uh, Regal Princess, uh, Majestic, and things like that. And then we just came up, just uh, about a couple of years ago, we just released from working here a series of uh, what we call Penicetum orient uh, Allopecuroides grasses, ornamentals, produce a lot of seed, but we sterilize them. They don't produce any seed. Uh, and they all have Cajun names like praline, uh, uh, jambalaya, and, and things like that. And uh, so anyway, it's been a tremendous cooperative uh, team effort. I, would, I guess the best way to describe it is a team effort between Tifton and Blairsville here uh, to be able to produce cultivars. It's just, uh, we couldn't have done it any, in any other state the way we did it here. Hello, my name is Esther van der Knaap and I'm a professor in the Department of Horticulture in the Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics and Genomics at the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. My research focuses on tomato diversity for crop improvement traits. So we're looking to tap into the diversity of tomato varieties that we have in our collection to improve the modern tomato. Simply put, our research focuses on three traits. Two are related to fruit morphology. One is fruit size and the other is fruit shape, as well as the taste of the tomato, uh, in, in particularly the volatile aroma that tomato fruits emit. So about fruit shape and size, it's very important to realize that tomatoes uh, that you see in the grocery store didn't start out like that. Tomato uh, has a wild relative and that species makes very tiny red fruits that are edible, uh, but they don't taste or look at all like the, the modern tomatoes. So we work with those because there are some useful traits in those wild species that we can use to improve the flavor of the tomato. Uh, then tomato evolved from this wild species to a more intermediate type which very much looks like a cherry tomato as you can see here. The fruits are bigger, they are also more tasting like a modern tomato, but they're not quite the size that uh, most industries uh, demand. So from that tomato was selected further to, uh, to, make, uh, to, to become a much larger fruited type that you find typically in grocery stores. We do a lot of our research here in Blairsville because of the different environment that it offers to other sites where we grow our tomatoes, in particular with our colleagues in Florida, at the University of Florida, uh, for volatile research. So we do a volatile project here in Blairsville as well as in, in Florida. And then we can compare and contrast the different environmental impact on the flavor of the tomato. So we do our work uh, with, with the graduate students and the postdocs and staff in my lab. And we start out in the laboratory and the greenhouse with making crosses between uh, different looking or different tasting tomatoes. And then we propagate those, those populations, we get into the next generation, and then we bring them out to the field for, for evaluation. Uh, we, we come over with the entire lab and we get wonderful support here from the Blairsville staff to help us plant. Um, uh, they of course have already prepared the field before we come out. So they help us with the planting as well, which is always really wonderful. Um, they take care of our plants while they're growing because they do need some, uh, they need, do need some attention uh, to make sure that there are no diseases uh, wiping them out uh, or, or, or other bugs that, uh, that would destroy the plants. And then at the end of the season, uh, we also come out with the entire lab. We usually stay at a local uh, cabins here to harvest the tomatoes and either weigh them or analyze them for the volatile production. Again, with wonderful help from the station people up here. So um, the tomatoes, what we, what we hope to do with our research uh, is to then, you know, our findings from that, from that field site is to go back to take it back to the lab and then analyze more in detail uh, what is going on. We are particularly interested in identifying a, a gene that would control the volatile production and increase the volatile production of a volatile that we like. 
or increase the size of the tomato fruit or give it a particular shape. So we're very interested in identifying the genes. And the genomes of all these varieties that we grow, uh, that we have the genome information and with that information we can actually make very rapid progress in gene identification. So that's what we do in the lab. And then we come back the following year for another field experiment to test whether our hypotheses uh, are uh, not refuted, uh, that we are actually on the right track to identify uh, the gene that causes the improvement in the character of the tomato. In the end, we hope that our research uh, will contribute to a better tasting, a better shaped or a better sized tomato. Um, while maintaining the qualities that we also need in modern tomato, which is high yielding, disease resistant and uh, 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 manageable to grow and harvest for growers. My name is uh, Rachel Smith. I am a graduate student doing my master's in horticulture um, with the State Botanical Garden of Georgia under Dr. Affolter. And our goal of our research here um, and also repeated in Athens, is to look at Monarda, uh, the genus commonly known as bee balm, uh, a species that naturally occurs in Georgia uh, natural lands, and then also a species that is cultivated um, in the green industry and has several native Rs available for uh, consumer use in, in the home garden. Um, Part of our goals here is to assess the uh, ecological value to wildlife uh, through nectar and pollen characteristics of bee balm uh, and see if there's variation between the naturally occurring species and our cultivated species that we use in our gardens by looking at the nectar characteristics, specifically sucrose per flower and then also cataloging the uh, pollinators that we see on the bee balm, um, which includes uh, visual observations and then also sweep netting to uh, get vouchers that we will identify to a species level in the lab using a microscope. Um, the, the point of this research is for us to uh, ask this question that's been asked over numerous species of what are the, the trade-offs when we cultivate a plant um, for our use in our gardens by making it more resistant to disease or more compact for your perennial bed um, and how that affects the wildlife that uses the plant. Uh, so we uh, repeated this trial in Athens and then also in Blairsville because the species um, Monarda also occurs naturally in the Blairsville Montane region. Um, and you can find it in a lot of our national parks here. And so it was just the perfect place to repeat the trial uh, since many of our, our species naturally occur in this Montane region. And uh, we just um, did that here and then in Athens to assess the pollinator component as well as resistance to powdery mildew and uh, root rot. In this trial, um, we are testing 10 different taxa of bee balm. Uh, this includes five species and five cultivars. The cultivars are available in um, the garden trade. You can buy them at most uh, nurseries or wholesale nurseries. And um, those cultivars include Jacob Klein, which is a Didyma variety, Raspberry Wine and Judith's Fancy Fuchsia, which is a cross between Didyma and an unknown, Grape Gumball, which is a Sugar Buzz series, um, and Fancy Fuchsia, oh, sorry. And uh, a cultivar of Monarda fistulosa Claire Grace. All of these have been bred to have a more compact form and higher resistance to powdery mildew and more uniformity when growing in the greenhouse. The species that we're testing in this plot include uh, Monarda punctata, which we have two ecotypes of. One ecotype is from a Georgia seed collection and then another one is from a New Jersey uh, propagation material. 
and those two vary in the color of their bracts. Uh, the Georgia ecotype has more pink bracts underneath the flowers, while the New Jersey ecotype has wider bracts. And then we're also including Monarda bradburyana, which is the northernmost species that occurs in Georgia, which makes it another perfect plant to test in the uh, another perfect plant to test in the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center. Um, and then we're including Monarda fistulosa and Monarda didyma also in those trials. Uh, those two vary by um, the color of their flowers. Monarda didyma is a red flower with longer corollas, and then Monarda fistulosa is a lighter lavender color with much shorter corollas. So we, we planted these trials um, in fall of 2019 at the uh, Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center, and we planted uh, at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia in uh, 2020, uh, that spring. Uh, we continued these trials for a total of two years, and I'll finish up my master's degree in the spring of 2022. So far, we have noticed that the flowers definitely vary in their shape and color, which is obvious to the naked eye. Um, we are still running analyses on the uh, sugar content to see if that variation is greater uh, between the cultivars and species than within the cultivars and species. And uh, we still have to suss out all of our insect collections as well. Um, right now we have a chest freezer in our lab full of uh, specimens that we're just waiting to identify. Um, and with this information, we will let you guys know a species list of what wildlife um, occurs on Monarda plants in the state of Georgia. And that way you as a gardener can be informed as to what wildlife you are supporting in your garden when you select certain cultivars. My name is Brian Schwartz and I'm a professor at the UGA Crop and Soil Sciences Department. I'm here at the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center on one of my centipede grass trials. And as a program, we've been researching and screening grasses here for over 20, 30 years and hopes to develop cold tolerant grasses that are adapted not only to Georgia, but all across the U.S. and world. Uh, some of our major goals here are to mimic environments that we have nothing similar to in South Georgia with the cold weather, freezes, off and on with hot as it is today, uh, influences and impacts of disease pressure and insects that we might not have at the Tifton Research Station. And I can honestly say it's, it's a station like this that we make major, major advances in genetics in where it would not be possible if we only worked in Tifton or we only worked in Athens or somewhere else. So a combinated effort with, with the professionals here where we can plant grasses, we can observe them for many years just as they would be in someone's home lawn or on a golf course or even a sports field. And we can just look for the genetics that come and rise to the top, uh, mimicked, uh, some situations that we would have to maybe get into the transition zone of the U.S. Uh, if we were screening, say, in Tennessee or Kentucky or North Carolina, but we have those conditions right here in Blairsville, and really uh, it's instrumental in the, the genetic gain, and in this case we're standing on a centipede grass trial, but we've screened Bermuda grasses, we've screened zoysia grasses, and we really hope to make big progress in the, the future years of uh, our breeding program here at Georgia. We're standing on a centipede grass trial, and as Dr. Hanna before me describes, this is essentially the lazy man's grass, where you can have it in your lawn, plant it, mow it, maybe fertilize it once a year, maybe no times a year, and you can have a beautiful lawn. Some problems that do arise with, with uh, homeowners is that they have a tendency to fertilize or over fertilize centipede grass, which ends up causing a centipede grass decline or disease. So here at the Mountain Research Station, we're we're not only screening for adaptation to the colder environment, but we also have a plan here and we're gonna do it right after this video is we're gonna over fertilize this centipede grass in hopes of encouraging disease in some and maybe finding some resistance in other grasses. It's just the ability to modify your research plan at research stations like this that gives us an advantage at Georgia, which le leads us to be able to develop cultivars that have been so widely adapted in the past. 
Uh, years past, we've worked with zoysia grass here and made tremendous gain with the hundreds of different varieties that we had just planted right behind me where we had disease pressure that was not seen in Tifton. We made many selections. We even made crosses based on the data that we uh, garnered here in Blairsville. And, in, and those crosses are growing right now in Tifton, Georgia. In fact, we have about 10,000 new ones that were just planted within the last few months that essentially were derived from the data that we collected here. And then I, I can talk about Bermuda grass. It's, it's what we're known for at the University of Georgia for breeding Bermuda grasses that are adapted just across the whole world, used in sporting fields, used on golf courses, used in home lawns. And we've had trials here in the past that have really kind of highlighted those genetic selections that, that really uh, separate when we talk about the heat and nematode tolerance in Tifton and the cold and disease pressure up here in Blairsville. Oh, my name is Ali Masawi. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences. Um, I'm based in the Athens campus um, and I'm leading the forage and biomass breeding program. Uh, to put in the context of what we are doing, when you think about Georgia and the southeast, most forage systems are based on summer crops, Bermuda grass and uh, millets and so on. And uh, these, they grow like three months a summer. And, when, and for the rest of the year, what the growers have to do, so they have to resort to planting annuals, plant them late, or they have to feed hay. Um, so our focus is on improving cool season forage grasses and legumes. Uh, the species we work with are primarily tall fescue, orchard grass, uh, alfalfa, white clover, uh, red clover. Uh, so we do breeding selection at Tifton and with the best selections we take them for variety testing like what you see behind us and what we are harvesting right now because we want to compare the performance of those entries against the commercial checks from other companies. Um, so we have a location at Tifton for grazing and stress uh, tolerance. We have a location at uh, Watkinsville, the JPC, and we have a location here at Blairsville. Uh, the Blairsville location has been a key for us because the selections we make Eventually, when we license them to companies, they are not going to market them just in the southeast. So they're going to take them to the transition zone or the fescue belt. Therefore, we have to test their performance um, in those locations. So we send, in addition to here, send our best entries to Kentucky trials, to Cornell and uh, to, to Wisconsin. Um, so. All the varieties actually you see now on uh, farmers' uh, fields, uh, they were developed in, uh, in our program here at UGA. So in tall fescue, when you think about Jessup Max-Q, so it was developed in our program by my predecessor, uh, Dr. Joe Bouton. Uh, white clover, the famous Durana, was developed in our program, alfalfa. Uh, Bulldog 805, Bulldog 505, so those are all uh, being developed in our program. So we have been very successful in developing elite cultivars that are contributing to the economy of the rural uh, Georgia and most of the southeast. Um, what we have here now, this is a variety trial. It's not part of the statewide variety trial, but this is a specific to the forage uh, breeding. Uh, when we make selections, we bring them here and plant them in replicated trials, and you see the harvester actually operating. We're, we're taking a cut of those trials today. Uh, and of course, we take this data, uh, analyze it, uh, and we have to do this for at least three years because with these perennials, uh, you know, performance for one year doesn't mean much because we want them to persist in the farm as long as, as, as possible while they are economic, production is economically feasible. Um, so we also take quality. So once we finish harvesting, at the same time we take samples, uh, we dry them, 
uh, grind them and then um, run analysis on near infrared spectroscopy to measure how much fiber, uh, how much digestibility, how, my, how much proteins, uh, sugars, minerals, and so on, because our interest is animal performance. So if this material is not digested, you know, the animal is not going to profit uh, from it. Uh, my name is Daniel Mailhot. I, I manage the statewide variety testing program from out of the Griffin campus. Uh, this is one of our several locations that we do corn testing at. Um, and it, it's, it's probably, you know, one of the most amazing in a lot of ways, given the climate that we have here. Um, but I, I guess to provide you a little bit of background, so I, I'm in the crop and soil science department uh, at, at UGA. And, uh, and what we do is we, we test crop varieties all around the state, uh, row crops and forages, to really try to find the best, best yielding varieties and to really characterize those varieties as far as their maturity and other characteristics you know, that are val of value to farmers. Um, and so, uh, so this site, this is a site where we've been doing research for years and years. Uh, th there's variety test re results going back to the 1950s from here that we've seen. And uh, it, it's, it's just always a very, very good site. Uh, part of the reason for this is, uh, is the soil. Our topsoil here is probably 12 inches or more in depth, and we're in a river bottom. Uh, it's also a, a site where we do not have the ex extremely hot temperatures that, in, that occur during other parts of the corn growing season around the state. Uh, both your day temperatures are cooler and your night temperatures, and that contributes to extremely high yields. This particular site is not irrigated, and we, however, we plant a 34,000 seed per acre rate, which is what we normally do under irrigated conditions, and we get yields as high as 360 bushels an acre. Um, so it's it's definitely you know a good good place to be planting corn at, um, and so in this particular test behind me, we have 18 different varieties of corn, uh, and these are you know come from various companies uh, that want to participate in our tests. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're just trying to find, you know, that best fit, you know, for what is, what is going to give you the best yields in this kind of an environment. And one of the things that's also really interesting is that because this environment is so productive, it's actually highly predictive of what varieties will do well in South Georgia irrigated fields uh, under, you know, optimum irrigation conditions. And so uh, among the traits that we're looking at, we're looking at, at yield itself. Uh, we're looking at maturity, which we're determining based on the, on the moisture at time of harvest. Uh, we're looking at test weights. We want to make sure that's going to be good quality corn. Uh, also looking for just any kind of, you know, potential disease problems or anything, anything like that that could be, you know, problematic for the farmer to make sure that you can avoid those problems yourself. Uh, that's really, you know, we're hoping that we're the ones who have the problems and not you. Uh, so, so you can find out about these tests uh, on our website. Uh, it's swvt.uga.edu, and that's where we publish all of our results for the different crops. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, uh, you know, please check that out. And our publications, they come out, you know, following the cropping year. Uh, the corn publication usually comes out in late fall, um, uh, you know, shortly after we harvest here. Um, but yeah, it, this site, it's, it's the last one that we, that we plant in the year because it has the shortest growing season. And we usually plant it in late April. Uh, usually that last week of April, and we harvest about the first week of October uh, when the corn reaches about 18 to 20 percent moisture. It, and so with our climate here being quite a bit cooler, it, it, it's actually, it actually reflects more what you get up in Midwestern states potentially, you, you know, where you have those cooler summers. And so it gives corn companies the opportunity to kind of see, you know, for a variety that they're marketing here in the south, how might it perform further north? Uh, you know, I mean, given given that yield potential, and especially, you know, when you go go to an, in, into an environment where you have lower lower disease pressures, lower disease and insect pressures as well. Hi, my name's Tom Kahn, and I'm an assistant professor based at North Carolina State University. I have a multi-state appointment with NC State, University of Clemson, and University of Georgia. This was arranged because there's a strong apple industry here in the southeast and between, through a multi-state agreement, uh, those three institutions all contributed to the startup of this position and this research program to serve the southeastern apple industry. We, just uh, this year in 2021, we established this research orchard right behind me here. It's a three by 12 planting, um, which we would consider a high density orchard system here in the southeastern United States. And when I say high density, it's, it's 
there's more trees per unit land area. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to that. As you increase the number of trees per unit land area, there's a lot of gains in efficiency. The efficiency of light interception uh, per unit land area. Gains in efficiency with labor inputs because you're dealing with very simplified canopy systems. And also efficiency of other inputs like pesticides and fertilizer. One of the main incentives for adopting a high density orchard system like the one behind me is that you can really be set up well for future labor saving technologies that are already in the works for apple growers um, worldwide. We planted this research orchard for two purposes. The first being to initiate a project that would evaluate different irrigation paradigms here in the southeastern United States. There aren't many growers that have adopted irrigation at all in their apple production systems. And what we're hoping to evaluate here is three different methods for irrigation input to see if that practice has value in increasing tree growth and hopefully productivity uh, in future years. This project will focus on different ways to irrigate these trees, but one of them will be model-based, which will utilize a locally um, available weather station that we deployed here this past year. Um, and what will be great is that rather than just a grower estimating, well, it didn't rain this week, so I need to put out an inch of water, we'll be able to, to apply water in a way that's responsive to the estimated physiological needs of that tree and hopefully have a more precise application of that water right at the right time. The second project that we're uh, initiating this year is uh, an effort to try and stimulate lateral branching on young apple trees. This is important because some apple varieties really struggle to produce lateral branches naturally in the orchard system. And the number of lateral branches is tied to the bearing surface of that, that apple tree, which is tied to the number of flower structures on that apple tree, which ultimately impacts yield and profitability in the orchard system. This will be a long-term study um, of these different apple branching strategies um, in this, in, in, across two cultivars in this trial. And the hope here is that we'll be able to not only understand which treatments stimulate a lateral branch production, but also which treatments will produce a greater number of apples for growers in future years. So we'll be maintaining that trial for about a five year period. So we selected this location uh, for the installation of this planning and, and subsequent research for, for multiple reasons outside of the beautiful scenery. Um, we are located in close proximity to Georgia's apple industry, which is located in the northern part of Georgia. And the idea here is that it, we wanted to test these different uh, inputs, whether it be irrigation or inputs to stimulate lateral branching in an area that would be applicable directly to the growers that we're serving. So the, the, the other reason that we're here in Blairsville at the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center is because this research facility has a long history of supporting apple research um, to again support the industry here in North Georgia and there's infrastructure set up here a great talented staff to work with and support this project in the way that it needs to be so that we can deliver this information to the people that need it. My name is Timothy Kulong. I'm a professor um, extension vegetable specialist at the University of Georgia in the Department of Horticulture uh, based out of Athens. So here we're looking at um, nine different uh, sweet corn varieties. They're sugar enhanced or SE types, uh, typically which are a little bit more popular for roadside stands and direct marketing. Of course, that's kind of the, the main type of production system up here in the mountains with a lot of weekend uh, tourists and farmers markets and so on. And so these were nine SE varieties um, that we're looking at, um, of course, yield, but then other quality parameters such as ear size, tip fill, and of course, flavor which is probably the most important. So um, with this, uh, of course, uh, the Blairsville Research Station here, the Mountain Research uh, Center, um, the director, Ray Covington, we got together earlier in the year, and then Jacob um, in the Union, Union County Extension Office worked with us to uh, figure out the size and scope of the experiment and really uh, sit down to figure out 
what we can do to make sure that the data that we get from this is most helpful to the clientele up here. So um, once we crunch all the data, um, it'll be publicly available, but uh, typically we do some county level regional meetings uh, here in the winter time where we can share that with uh, local growers. Um, Jacob will have the data available as well at the county office. So if someone comes in and says, hey, you know, what, what types of uh, new varieties of corn are looking good? He can actually go back, uh, use peer you know, research, uh, scientific data to, you know, give them some really good answers. My name is Phil Brandon. I'm with the Plant Pathology Department of the University of Georgia. And today we are in uh, one of my Apple experiments here at the uh, Blairsville Research Station. This uh, particular trial is looking at glomerella leaf spot. Uh, it's a disease that came in from Brazil originally, but it's causing a lot of problems on certain apple varieties, uh, defoliating the apples. As you can see here, if you look behind me, you don't see a whole lot of leaves on these trees. Uh, a lot of leaf spotting and that will actually completely defoliate this apple tree and uh, also gets on the fruit. This year we don't have any fruit out here because of all the freezes we had in the spring, but we can still do testing on the leaves and see what our fungicide programs will do with that. And so again, if you look at this, we have a lot of defoliation on this. This is an untreated. Uh, by the end of this year, I would expect that you'll have no leaves left on these trees. These trees potentially could die because they don't have enough energy to uh, live through the winter. To go over here, we get into some area where we're treating with our spray regimens. And these spray regimens are the ones that we develop for producers. And uh, you can see some spotting, but not nearly as much. Obviously, we're gonna keep our leaves. These plants will be healthier long-term. And so it's not nearly as bad. We utilize a lot of students to help with this labor up here as well in the various research projects. Today, I've been up with students uh, taking measurements on the amount of disease that we have here and what the impact of this disease has been. And then we'll take that information and relay it to producers this next year. Uh, this particular project is not evaluating new chemistries. What we're really doing here is looking at all the chemicals that are available and trying to develop a spray program with all the products that are out there. So this one is not a new chemistry uh, trial. Uh, I, we, we would do that in certain times. We may do that next year see if we can find better fungicides for this disease. But right now we're taking all the fungicides we have, putting those into various spray programs and then seeing what works the best. Well, we'll go through with this information once it's developed and we'll put it out obviously at producer meetings. So we'll talk to the guys there and can provide them with that information. Uh, this information will also be reported in the uh, plant disease management reports, which go out throughout the entire nation. This particular disease is a problem really uh, particularly in the southeast in a warm humid environment we have but it's, it's moving further north as the winters continue to increase in temperature and summers do as well okay so now we're in our disease vineyard here at the blairsville station and we do all kinds of research up here on various types of diseases that can occur on grapes and a lot of the european grapes in particular like the merlot and chardonnay which we have here in this vineyard are very susceptible to a multitude of diseases uh, we've studied things like downy mildew and powdery mildew up here in particular. And this year, our trials are all concentrating on trying to control powdery mildew. Uh, the powdery mildew trials that we have here this year, we're looking at uh, combinations of various products uh, to try to get better disease control. Uh, we're looking at resistance management in particular and trying to develop the best resistance management programs with the fungicides we have for powdery mildew. These grapes, if you look at them, they actually have powder mildew on the leaves and they do have it on the grape clusters as well. It's a lot easier to see on the leaves whenever you see any of this white type uh, powdery type uh, mildew on the top of the leaves, that's powdery mildew. And it can cover these leaves, but if it gets on the fruit, it actually will render that fruit useless for produ production of wine. And so we have to have uh, clean fruit going into our wineries. That's why we do this research. And again, the information we derive from these trials uh, will allow us to give uh, the, the vineyard operators the information they need to spray and then to not have disease. So that's, that's why we do this research. Uh, we utilize a lot of uh, students in this research. We've had graduate students who've done their research programs. I recently had one that just finished up about a month ago. Now she's in California. We had another one that finished up a couple of years ago working on uh, the grape projects. And so uh, it allows us to work with graduate students, undergraduate students, and do a lot of good work for the producers that which they need, obviously, for this type of, uh, of a disease. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Mim. We're here today at the Georgia Heritage Apple Orchard in, in Blairsville at the Mountain Research and Education Center. 
uh, as part of the University of Georgia's agricultural uh, research. Uh, I'm a history professor in Franklin College at UGA, and what you're looking here at is, a, is an orchard that was uh, the product of many different groups coming together under the auspices of a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture known as a Specialty Crop Block Grant. And its ambition and its focus is to go back and revive, preserve, and ultimately reintroduce heritage apple varieties that once grew in Georgia, most of them commercially, about 100 years ago. It's a little known fact, actually, that, that Georgia once had an extraordinarily important apple industry that uh, yielded apples and varieties that won national awards and fame for the state uh, in areas like this up in the mountains. Um, but also apples were grown as well, believe it or not, in even warmer regions of the Piedmont, all the way down uh, as far south as the fall line in the state of Georgia. At one time, uh, there were approximately 135 varieties that are no longer grown uh, commercially that thrived in the state of Georgia. Um, and this orchard aims to, to preserve them um, because many of them were in the danger of disappearing altogether and going extinct. And in fact, this project began in, in the hopes of reviving and finding some of the, the, the cultivars that already went extinct. Um, and we have had some very modest success in that, but we've come to realize that we already have this amazing repository of genetic material of apples that thrive in this somewhat warmer climate of the mountainous south. There are several reasons why this project is, is important and why it's, it's, it's not simply an exercise in nostalgia or the preservation of history. Uh, the first is that there are many forces that are conspiring to make consumers increasingly interested in varieties of fruit uh, and vegetables as well that have taste profiles or have uses that, that maybe transcend the, the usual handful of su usual suspects that you might find in your grocery store. Many of the apples that you see here, for example, taste differently than, than the apples that you might be familiar with, like a Granny Smith or a, a Gala or what have you. And so th there are applications for these apples in, in restaurants and in cooking and in also in agritourism, which is a very fast growing segment of the Georgia economy. As Atlanta has grown, Sutu has an appetite for rediscovering and connecting with the kinds of um, heritage varieties that once formed a mainstay of the Georgia diet and by extension, the American diet. There's another set of, of applications here for this orchard. Uh, the cider industry is, is growing by leaps and bounds in the United States. And cider is a, something that requires a very specific set of apples. And many of these varieties actually are extraordinarily well suited for cider production. They have taste profiles or sugar levels that are unusual and have yet to be tested for this. And so we're hoping to reintroduce these varieties for that purpose as well. And then the final application, uh, and one that, that goes well beyond the borders of Georgia, is that we currently live in an era where, by growing consensus, climate change may pose a threat to existing crops and agricultural practices. The apples that once grew in this region of Georgia are somewhat different in that they evolved and were selected for qualities that are different than, than apples, say, grown in Washington State. Uh, they thrive, in fact, in climates that are somewhat more warmer and humid, which may well be our future collectively on planet Earth. And if so, the genetic material contained within these trees may well yield the, the basis for new varieties that can accommodate and meet the challenges of climate change.